My name's Ross Duncan and I'm your host for today's Coffee Break. I'm a frontline member of staff and I work in our curriculum team as a curriculum and module lead. Our Social Work Coffee Break series is designed to give you the opportunity to explore new ideas learn practical skills and connect with social workers from across the country. They cover a variety of topics and give Frontline Fellows, anyone who has completed one of Frontline's programmes, the chance to share their master's dissertation research, projects, innovations and much more with the wider sector. We hope you'll leave the session today having learned something new and with practical tips and advice you can implement into your practice. Today's session will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel and I would encourage everyone that's watching to ask questions in the Q&A section and I'll put them to our presenter at the end. Um, we'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can. Today our topic is on supporting family networks through family spaces with James Dean. James is a Frontline Fellow having completed the Frontline programme in 2023 and a social worker based in London. He has a passion for applying systemic practice in child protection, social work, whilst adopting a restorative stance with families and their networks. So without further ado, I'll hand over to James um, to do today's presentation. Over to you, James. Thanks, Ross, and thanks everyone for coming. I'm looking forward to just uh, having a conversation, really, talking about something that I'm quite interested in and I'll um, I'll share my slides so we can get going. So look. OK, let me just double check things are OK. I don't want to yeah, that. There good. we go. Is that all good? All OK, good. great. All right. Um, yeah, I think first thing to say, you know, this is a space for us to think a little bit about how we work with family networks and I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of working with family networks, um, about the theories we can think about when working with family networks in family meetings or family spaces and just offer some of my own experience of trying this out through my dissertation and some of the feedback I got from the families I worked with. I guess the thing I want to say is that I'm not an expert in working with family networks, it's something I'm kind of interested in and something I wanted to apply and really think about. And so I acknowledge that this is just kind of one perspective and where you are in your different contexts, your di different local authorities or maybe different roles, you might have different experiences of this and the ways in which we work with family networks. So I guess I really want to keep this more like a conversation we can have today or a conversation you have with people with where you work. Um, I guess the important thing is to really set the context first. So working with family networks is a key outcome now for social care practitioners. So we had the independent review and that one of the outcomes of that independent review was our new national framework. And one of the outcomes in that national framework is building and strengthening family networks. And I think the key words there are build and strengthen. So um, yeah, I'm about how do we work in ways in which we are helping family networks get better at being family networks and working together but also helping those who might not have a network just yet um, and so there's a real prerogative on us to try and do this and work in ways which will do this um, but i guess we have to, all, have to also acknowledge some of our restraints so thinking about restraints in our organization but maybe also in our social context so one of the key things i guess i want to think about is around social capital so thinking it there's a little picture there on the things that make social capital but what i guess what we see over society you know for a number of decades is the impact of ideology neoliberalism and the value of the individual individual and the traditional family on social capitals that the families have. Um, there's a famous social scientist called Putnam who did a lot of research in social capital in America and found that social capital in American society was falling. And I would imagine, I think this is also related to the UK as well, which kind of went through a similar, um, I guess, political history in some ways. Um, and 
when we think of what's what is social care's role we are in some ways quite a formal care and control network you'll hear the words care and control together and actually you think about what is a family network or a family i guess that's an informal way of caring and looking out for children and it's just thinking a little bit about when we work with family networks how much how much are they being impacted by maybe some of the societal pressures for them to kind of work together um, you can think about the impact of covid but i you know i can give an example of housing for example and temporary accommodation let's say you work with a mother who has to flee due to domestic abuse you know i work in london so social housing is very rare to get in 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 a, in a london often families get moved way out of london the out, outskirts of london and what you're what's taking place there is a real distancing often families from their roots from where they belong from their networks and that makes it harder i think for those families to work together and that would be an impact on the social capital of families so it's something that i do want to kind of put in your minds just to think about about the wider factors that might be impacting some of the social capital of the families you work with and how we can work to address that. In terms of thinking about working with family networks and having family meetings, I guess the core like, principle of this comes from restorative practice. And that comes from restorative justice, which has been a, a new way of working with young offenders and repairing harm through the relationships. This has also been extended to uh, working with family networks within families to repair harm that's happened in the family and the roots of this practice come from the maoris in new zealand who were working with white social workers in new zealand and the maoris had a culturally different way of responding to incidents that would happen in within their community and they would um deal with situations within their community and have an established way of resolving things according to their roots and their culture out of that kind of uh, critique and resistance to a kind of white social work practice, we saw family group conferences as a method of working with families to give them the space to solve problems for themselves, come up with plans for themselves. And this may be something that you have in your local authority, it might not be, or there might be different ways in which you have these family spaces. Um, but I guess what's underpin, underpinning them is kind of supporting families to take some responsibility, to feel empowered, to take action, to solve things themselves. And I would, my, my thinking is if family networks are supported to do that, it's going to be healthier long term if we're thinking about change for children. Now, I guess one of my things that I found in practice is that, um, and I saw this in the research that I did, is that family group conferences I kind of had mixed results for families. They are very task orientated. You're having a plan. Decisions need to be made. And I had some families that I worked with which didn't really find the FGC process that helpful. It's quite formalized, procedural. Um, maybe sometimes it felt like a bit of a tick box. And actually, some of the research found that it it was not necessarily the meeting. It's it's not necessarily the plan that helped, but it was the process of like bringing the family together which was helpful and I kind of got the same impression from the FGCs that I attended um, so yeah so other parts of research talked about the process being important so I was really interested okay how could I maybe replicate that process in working with families maybe through a more informal way um, and I guess looking at uh, the research around family group conferences and family meetings you know it's really varied the way you can do it and I, I was thinking to myself I, I want to maybe something more dynamic something that can just um, respond to the family in the moment feel more fluid more organic in working with the family and getting them involved and there's you know some uh, research about how family therapists and family group conference coordinators can perhaps lean on each other and I was thinking about okay how might I apply some systemic ideas in those family spaces and I'm using the, these words meeting spaces quite interchangeably because um, I don't know that's a question I have at the moment about the language we use to think about bringing families together uh, which I'll come back to 
Um, so yeah, I guess a, a question for you to think about for yourself is like, what's your experience of family group conferences? And how, where and how might you already be doing family meetings? Is this something you're doing already, you know, family meetings? How are you working with family networks? So bringing it back to some systemic ideas to think about when working with family networks, I was kind of interested in the dialogical approach. So that is kind of, there's two forms of that that I think about. One is the actual meeting itself. So instead of, you might have some questions you might want to ask, but the real purpose is trying to get everybody to listen to each other. Everyone has a voice um, and kind of, flowing with what comes out in the meeting rather than having kind of preset questions. So if you, in my experience, family group conferences, you will have set questions that are answered and the family will think about it in their own time. And I kind of found that the most action kind of took place when I was able to respond and come back into the plan and we were able to talk about what's going on. So I really wanted to think about that in the meeting with family networks. At the same time, Thinking dialogically, I think also means about thinking about social constructionism and think about how we can open up the process of what is a family meeting with the families we work with. So really kind of developing a family space with the family networks, you know, with the parent as you're thinking about what it's going to look like. Um, the other theory that I kind of thought about was positioning theory. So, you know, if you're in a meeting with multiple people, it's very much thinking about what position you want to take. Do you want to be a bit more facilitative? Do you want to be directive? When are the times where I might need to step in? Um, also, like thinking about you as a social worker because you're not a therapist, you're not um, a family group coordinator, you're involved in the plan, you're involved in the family, you have power. So that was something to really think about in those meetings. And uh, there's some feedback which I got which really helped me think about that. There's this other that idea called second order sculpting. So this is really think about how you set up a room, how you set up a space um, to create um, a space where you, you can have a dialogue, where you can have a conversation, where people are opening up to listening, you know, where are people going to see, sit, is there going to be some tea, some coffee, where is it going to be, all these ideas is very much crafting the space to have this kind of space and that might be in a family home or it might be somewhere else, but those are also important things to think about. And the, the last um, part of positioning was comes from Glenda Fredman's paper on emotional postures. So again, thinking these family meetings can actually be quite emotional and depending on the relationships in the family, you, you want to think a little bit about the kind of posture you might need to take in yourself in terms of your own body language to invite others to think curiously together, to be open to maybe shifting their minds in some way. Um, yeah, so I was taking these two ideas, dialogical and positioning, and kind of kind of blending it a little bit with the kind of restorative practice and just kind of giving it a go. And from that, I got some feedback from families, and I think these are kind of considerations we can hold in mind when we think about working with families. One was around timing, so I did these interventions really at the end of the work with families and the feedback I was getting was that this should have happened a lot sooner um, and that people in the network would have kind of wanted to come forward but didn't necessarily know how and that's something I've been thinking about now when working with families that I've been trying when I work with them from the beginning actually making quite an intention to involve people earlier um, Another consideration is who to invite, who's going to be in that, in that meeting. It doesn't have to be um, everyone there, but really thinking through with the parent actually about the relationships, about who is supportive, because there might be some people in the family that might be, it might be quite challenging maybe in the first time to bring them in. Um, but yeah, one of the feedbacks I got is just, it's good to think about these relationships beforehand. Um, the other part was actually for the parent to uh, kind of open up the problem, open up the struggle of what's going on, maybe personally for them or with their children, it can be a really hard task. And 
with just other families I've worked with in the past, often they don't want to trouble other people in their family. Everyone's struggling, everyone's kind of got their own problems. And that can feel a bit of a barrier for parents to maybe ask for help. And I think establishing a, that relationship with a parent it feels really important. Like you kind of joining that network to help that process of coming together feels like an important step. But like I don't know how it would be if I didn't really know the parent, how it would be to really expand that. I guess it's really gauging with the parent and yeah, just finding out who's around and who is there, who's 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 helping at this point in time. Yeah, and then the last two considerations that came forth were felt for me quite important. One of them was about the children's voice and how they participate. So in both the spaces I had with with the families, the the child wasn't there either because I guess of their age, but or because they refused. And I had to really think about actually how do we bring the child into the room? So maybe role playing as the child, bringing the child's voice. But also, now that I'm working with some new families, I'm really thinking, oh, I really want to find a way to bring that child into a space that's going to feel comfortable for them, especially as they get older. Um, yeah. And yeah, the other thing was just the thinking around this positioning. So in uh, one of the family meetings that I had, I took quite a facilitative role, so kind of like stood back a little bit, kind of allowing the network to talk amongst themselves. But often I found that they they wanted to know really what I thought. And um, I was I was asked a quite a direct, direct question, like, what do you think's best? Like, what, what, what do you think is right? And whether or not I wanted to take a facilitated role or not kind of position myself as someone that doesn't is sharing the power, I can be seen as someone that has power and has a voice. And so I had to really think actually about it is OK for me to share what I think. Like I'm part of this network as well. And just being mindful about how I might do that, or how I might say it, but that it is still important for you to have some kind of say. Um, in a meeting and that doesn't necessarily mean you're using your power too but you can use it in a way with families um yeah so thinking out of all the feedback i got i really thought about yeah these two poles of being directive and facilitative in meetings and i know that i definitely privileged being a facilitator um and i found that in one meeting it was actually fine I really didn't actually I felt like I didn't need to be there and I could really see you know the private family time is like see it work out in the family group conference I didn't feel like I needed to be there um, whereas in another meeting where I needed to kind of say something I needed to be a bit more directive about why we were together and what we were focusing on um, required me to shift and be able to respond to the the relationships with the family so there's this diagram here of the relationship window and um you can kind of map this maybe with with fam with a parent you might work with like I had one parent who put a lot of their friends in that with section and it was those friends that I, I could just see if they could just come up with something themselves and talk about something themselves but in other families where there might be a doing to relationship and they're involved in the meeting you might see power in the conversation itself almost influencing the dialogue and actually if you as the the social worker in that situation might need to be directive in order to have a more effective dialogue and so i think there's a way of being both directive and facilitative i guess the facilitative can be a really around yeah you can be directively facilitative if that makes sense like having a real intention of yeah bringing the network together um directing that as maybe uh, an approach that that you that you feel is beneficial for the child and at the same time in meetings as well you might need to be more directive in order to really bring it back to the child um uh, which can sometimes get lost in these meetings so um yeah just being able to adapt and respond 
In terms of thinking about any other ideas, family spaces, I've already talked a little bit about thinking about how to map relationships with parents, maybe an eco map, maybe those that relationship window. But doing that early on, you can start to build what is the network, what does it look like? And that can really help later down the line, even if you're in court proceedings, for example, like you've built a relationship with the network already, you might understand who helps and who understands, you know, what's going on for the child and things like this. There are also some good uh, questions you might be able to ask a parent. So this was taken from Richard Devine's blog, who, which I would recommend. Um, and he did a blog about uh, family networks and he put down some of these questions which you might be able to ask a parent about um, about the network, who's in their life and who they reach out to um, as to kind of help that mapping process. Yeah, and then the other thing is just thinking about when do we have the family meetings? I, I'm kind of just thinking like, oh, within what about if in the first visit I ask to kind of meet, you know, whoever the someone in their network who's around, it could be a brother, it could be the the grandmother, it could be a family friend. I'm starting to do this now, of almost, yeah, doing this now with one family and I think it's helping warm up the context for having bigger family spaces or making this a way of working um so i kind of wonder how people would think about or what what people's experience has been of kind of working with family networks because some families might have their network round and you might bump into them that, that day and it can feel almost feel like sometimes there are really opportunities to 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 do that building and that strengthening when when that happens uh, another thing to think about was just about the child's position. So what I had after being asked, what do I think? I had to think about before those meetings, actually, what do I think is best for the child? If I was a child, what would I want? What And really knowing myself, what I could say in those meetings if it was needed, but all coming from a place of what's best for the child and taking up kind of um, a kind of caring voice for the child in those meetings, not to overshadow and overpower the, the meeting, but to still find a way to keep put your like kind of um, point across. But that also acknowledges that you do have a voice in this. Yeah, and then the other thing is this thing about language. So how do we define these things, meetings, spaces, conferences, gatherings? I guess finding a language with the with the parents that you work with. I guess meetings and conferences can sound quite professional. Someone says I have a meeting, I'm a bit like, oh gosh, a bit already anxiety is going. Um, so I guess I've been using them quite interchangeably, but I think that that's an important thing to also think about and that ties into the idea of social constructionism, like what is this, what are these terms that we're using and what do they mean to people? And yeah, there might be many different ways of delivering family group conferences and family meetings that I don't know about, um, that you might be trying out, that you've experienced. And yeah, I wonder a little bit about what what else, what else is there? And I guess that might be something for, for you guys to, to think about or or put in the chat. So yeah, that's that's um, that's my talk. I guess I'll, um, I'll come out the screen, come out the presentation, and we'll have a conversation. Or should I keep the slides up? Uh, hi, James. Firstly, thanks very much. Um, I think it, it, it's up to you. You can kind of close the slides down, and we can we can see everyone. I've I've asked people um, in the chat if you want to ask any questions. Just please do pop the questions in the chat, and I'll put them. To James, but yeah, I think some really interesting things to think about. And I think when I was kind of listening, there, there was lots of things that kind of struck me, um, uh, things that were kind of curious. I think a question that I had was how how have you found kind of tr facilitating spaces or or next when there's a much looser structure? Obviously, a lot of our kind of meetings have quite a process don't they they have we have clear agendas we have kind of roles and responsibilities how have you navigated that space of it being deliberately kind of a bit freer how have you found that um i think it's yeah i think it's like i guess the when we have uh the agenda and i think it's privileged when we think about like having an agenda and something to to think about, I guess it's like this idea of we need to plan something, we need to action something. But sometimes 
it's having a bit of a balance of just bringing people into a conversation and hearing the other voices that you know parents often are already talking to their friends or their family and inviting them into the room sometimes can help understand actually what are the other what's the stories going on what else are they talking about with each other but you being able to um hear that so i think it's yeah it's almost like n n talking with the parent about yeah maybe there are some bigger things to think about and maybe we can have a think actually about what you would like to think about with your network but i do know that for parents it can feel it's almost preparing them for that and feeling like they have a bit of control in terms of what are the things that are going to be talked about um and yeah i feel like the fluidness like bringing together inviting people is almost part of that preparation of maybe something that can feel a bit more formal mm -hmm. um but that formality it can be something that is more co-constructed with with the parent rather than uh necessarily a family group conference but that's not for me to say like i also think some family group conferences have been helpful like i'm not saying that family group conferences are bad but it's more to do with um yeah feeling skilled and equipped to try and do some of that kind of working earlier um i'm just more more fluid in response to families when we when we visit them we mm. talk to them and you, I mean, you did you did touched on the kind of the timings of it. When when did you get a sense of would be the kind of the right time to approach kind of bringing people together in the kind of structure, like from your perspective, mm. including the feedback that you were given. Like, at what point would you would you think you should do that? Mm. I do think it like sometimes like situations happen, incidents happen. There's a crisis and those can feel like the times to bring together and i know that family group conferences often are used for that to help with decisions um sometimes that can feel like a an important step to bring people together um and yeah i i think it's like a, a continual conversation really like again you know if you're working with families on child and need plans it's really about you know consent and making sure things are moving at a speed that the families are going to feel comfortable with because again it culturally as well like thinking about you know, from south america that i worked with the idea of sharing something beyond the family mm. was something that would bring up a lot of shame and in order to get to that point you really have to have that really trusting relationship with that parent and to be able to understand culturally like what would it mean to actually share some of what's happened with someone else mm. um so yeah maybe there's a, com a conversation there a little bit about our graces our culture how how you who 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 knows who 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 is informed of these things and is that related to perhaps your culture and your ethnicity or what you you're used to as a child um yeah thanks james um question here from sarah so she says hi james how have you found balancing immediate responses to risk versus taking a bit of time to hold the family group conference and seeing in what ways that can support to attend to risk yeah so i think i guess what i found a bit with the family group conference is that it can take a few weeks to get to the point where we might be talking together and perhaps the risk has changed in some way and so the situation's changed in some way so i find that i feel more responsive when i feel confident enough to bring people in sooner but at the same time there might be more long-standing things that need to be agreed and decided upon in terms of like safety plans or other things that might be need to be thought about in terms of the long-term risk with the family network so but um, I don't know how it is in other places like what the process is like to get a family group conference together and that might be one of the, the restraints that my organization might have and that's just 
yeah being aware of what is the restraint in my organization and um maybe that's why i've looked at doing this um with some of the families i think it's interesting to think about you know i think what you've invited us to think about is the family spaces or family meetings and a family group conference being quite a formal part of that process i suppose it's about how do you include the family network in those conversations about risk and how quickly could you do that when a family group conference and and the formality of that might take a few weeks and that that you know might not fit within the time scales of managing the mm. risk i suppose so maybe it's about inviting us to think about how do we include that network to try and put forward a, a, a you know a plan that will you know manage the risk more collaboratively i don't know what you think about that mm. yeah well i just had a i had a family group conference recently and one of the outcomes was actually they all want to have like a safety plan together and to then then I scheduled another one and then so it's yeah I've, it's yeah I what I guess what that's what I was yeah trying to say in that sense yeah yeah no well no just just again just say thank you so much the, the 30 minutes has flown by today it's such an interesting oh, well. topic but thank you again James for um that presentation